All right, so hi, I'm Charles Hoskinson. Thank you all for coming. You know, I was having a conversation this morning with a friend of mine, and I said, you know, I've been up since 5.30 in the morning, and uh, I've worn the same clothes for three days because they lost my luggage, and he said, oh, you must be in Odessa by then. <laughs> I was like, yeah, Odessa's a nice place. Um, this is, I think, my third or fourth BIP conference, and I keep coming. It's lovely. I uh, come for the weather, stay for the people. Um, anyway, I... Uh, I thought a bit about what I should talk about, you know, what would be meaningful. And so I've been kind of reviewing the types of questions that I've been getting over the last few uh, months. And the most significant set of questions have to do with regulation and ICOs. This is kind of the vogue topic, right? People are raising hundreds of millions of dollars, and what the hell does it all mean, and when are we all going to jail? Usually is the set of the progression of the questions I get from journalists. And, uh, and they say, have we ever had anything happen like this before? And I can't help but remember a quote, which is, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So I looked back to history and said, what part of history seems the most similar? And so people, because they tend to recall things closer than further away, they say, oh, the dot-com crisis. Not quite. There's actually a period of history that was very similar to the one we have today. And I brought a little something that's from that period. So this is a pocket watch. I collect them. It's made in Canton, Ohio in 1901. It's 115 years old, still runs. It's a nice watch. And it was right in the middle of the Knickerbocker crisis, right before of it. So 1907, the whole markets collapsed. It's a horrible event. America almost went bankrupt. J.P. Morgan had to bail out the country, and eventually it led to the creation of the Federal Reserve, the Pujo Commission, all this terrible stuff to go ahead and save America from itself and the excesses of capitalism. So what was going on in 1901? Well, we had trusts. We had rampant insider trading. We had this beautiful board transitivity where everybody was sitting on each other's boards. And you had, for the first time ever, people were able to invest in global investments. So if you were in America, you could buy bonds issued by a Japanese company. Couldn't do that before, at least not as an everyday person. And the markets collapsed. And so the regulators saved us, right? No, the 1920s happened, the melanomics. And then nine years after that, we had the Great Depression, and then after that, well, we created the Securities Exchange Commission in 1933. And the story goes on and on and on and on and on. And every time it'll be different because things change. Society changes. So anyway, uh, given that, I, I tried to think for a bit, how do we reconcile these legacy systems and legacy regulation with crypto systems? What's the same? What's different? And where are we going from a regulatory viewpoint? How do we kind of merge these two worlds together and hopefully create a better outcome? So I thought a bit about it, and I said, well, what do we have in commerce in the most abstract of ways that potentially could cause some issues for people? Well, first off, transactions have metadata. Does anybody know what metadata is? So metadata is kind of one of those ill-defined, nice topics that covers a lot of stuff. And actually, Bruce Schneier wrote a wonderful book almost completely about it called Data and Goliath. But I'll give you a scenario. So let's say Bob, every week, withdraws $400 from an ATM. That's an event. So let's add some color to that event. That's the metadata. So what if I was to tell you that that $400 he withdraws, that ATM, happens to be right next to a brothel, and Bob happens to spend an hour in that location after withdrawing it? Would that change your opinion of Bob or what Bob's doing with the money? Well, what if I give you more metadata? What if his favorite restaurant happens to be right next to that ATM? Is he sleeping with a hooker or eating lunch? It's hard to know. That's metadata, and that's the problem with metadata, is it's never complete enough, and the more of it you get, the more stories you can invent. And it's certainly mutable, it's certainly changeable, and it's certainly up to opinion and context. Okay, and it turns out modern financial systems are rich in metadata. Every time you buy something, you do something, it's recorded, it's put somewhere. All right, what else do we got? Well, we got attribution. So what's attribution? So when I send something from point A to point B, who owned point A? And who owns point B? Alice and Bob. How do we know who they are? And where did Alice get her money from? That's called origin of funds. And how far back can you follow that? How many hops? Where did it come from? Did it touch an embargoed country? Did it touch some money that was laundered? There's no de minimis clause on money laundering. It gets pretty complicated. And what are the costs associated with following that? So that's attribution. And, and that's a difficult topic unto itself. Are we done? No, we have intent. What's intent? 
So when Alice sent value to Bob, that's an event. It happened. And we can talk about it, provide metadata about it. We can identify the actors. But how do we know that Alice wasn't defrauded? So let's think about Ethereum. So if you bought the Ethereum ICO, you're a pretty happy guy right now, right? Because you made a lot of money. And so you think you're a genius. And you say, oh, of course. Yay, Vitalik. Yay, Ethereum. It's a wonderful thing. But what if Ethereum, let's play a mining experiment, collapsed? and they lost everything, and they never shipped a protocol. How many people would have wanted their money back, would have sued, would have said they were defrauded? Same transaction, Alice to Bob, but the difference was outcome. So it seems that you know, in this intent type of a deal, outcome's really important. But wait a minute, isn't that kind of predatory to the seller? Because if the buyer gets a good outcome, he's happy. If the buyer gets a bad outcome, he's, he's not happy. So you have to think about that. So these are all human things, and they live in the legacy financial system. And if you were living with Sargon 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, there would be some legal system, some methodology for addressing these things and providing a framework for these things to work. Now let's look to cryptocurrencies. History rhymes, it doesn't repeat. We have a new tool now, something that's changed the paradigm that allows us to do all these crazy things. And Cryptocurrencies are actually unique because they're not people. They're like mirrors that show us who we really are. Not who we want to be, but who we are. Shows us all of our sins and our hypocrisies and our flaws and our failings. And that's something we've never really had before in a commercial context. But we live with it every day. If you're a mover, you can't be holding this heavy box and say, you know, gravity, can you just get a little lighter for me today? I just want to... Or if you're on a mountain, you can't say, you know, air, can you get a little thicker? I'm getting a bit hypoxic. You're not allowed to change the laws of physics. And for a long time, humanity didn't like to accept that. And when we did, we invented this thing called the scientific method, and it's given us modern society. We didn't want reality as it ought to be, but reality as it is, we accepted it, and we lived with it, we built it, and it helped us improve, and it augmented us. Commerce doesn't behave this way. It's right now in the legacy world in a completely human sense. It's very subjective. It's very outcome-oriented. There's uh, many interpretations for the same set of facts and events. And then suddenly, what we have managed to do is invent a natural law for commerce. Protocols, where they are who they are. They don't change. And whether you agree with them, you like them, you accept the outcome or not, they're there. And I think that's something that's very special. The problem is that we don't understand it. We don't have models for it. We can't really understand what's rational and what's not rational when you're talking about non-humans and interaction with non-things. And you can certainly try to apply old methods like the scientific method. Roman does it, I do it, IOHK does it a lot. We think about provable security, we think about adversaries, we think about models. But at the end of the day, there's only so far that we can take these things. Because Vlad is actually very correct. There's something missing in that puzzle of how do you link the legacy with this new system. So let's wrap it up back to the beginning, which is regulation. How do you regulate these kinds of things? How do you change heart and minds? How do you create proper outcomes? And what is this all going to mean? Well, first, we're in a bubble, in my view. So it's going to collapse. The price will go down. And a lot of these businesses will wash away because they don't have good foundations. And that's nothing new. We've been through bubbles before. We've been through collapses before. And the strong will survive. There's a nice Darwinian view of these things. But moving beyond that, we have kind of two options. We can either repeat history and create another Federal Reserve and another Securities Exchange Commission and pray that this time we've gotten smart enough to change things. Or we can start asking, what parts of regulation can we now actually encapsulate in code and encapsulate in protocols as opposed to people? What about metadata can be made deterministic and objective? What about attribution ought to be declared? And we just have to accept that's the way it is and live with it just like we live with gravity. That is, I think, the ultimate challenge that we face as a space. And if we're actually able to solve this, then not only have we created something that is much more efficient and much more transparent, much better, but we've created something that actually will be global in nature. It becomes like a fundamental law of physics. And that means you don't need a regulator. You don't need a government to endorse it. You don't even need people to endorse it. 
like gravity, we just live with it. And that's actually my hope for what cryptocurrencies can bring to the conversation. It's a new idea, it's a new methodology, it's a kind of an artificial encapsulation of a, a physical law in a certain sense. And if we can get there, you'll notice some things. Scams will start disappearing. Commercial transactions will become far more fluid. We'll start standardizing things and things will become uniform. And you'll just have an expectation that things ought to work the way they ought to, as opposed to how they work today. So those are my thoughts on all of it. Um, I wanted to leave it a little bit philosophical and existential at a certain set. And uh, I love Q&A, so I'd love to get some questions. Thank you so much, Charles. Let's give a big round of applause. I'm coming to Vlad, anticipating some questions.